you were born when I was born, when we were born, I don't think there were quite as many avenues of possibilities. It was university, wasn't it? Yeah, but I don't think anyone really told me at high school how to prepare for university. A lot of people were just going out and doing trades. But I don't think there are so many people doing trades now. No, I think there is. I think the money that our, our society took is went to it. Plumbers and... Yeah. But it was I suppose it's just the no only plumbers. Like one of them went to university, which they had. I mean, they take it out. Can I speak for me? Well, I don't know. That's like, being a bit... If my kid wanted to be a plumber, I'd, I'd be like, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm sure your kid's not going to be a plumber because it's what it's around. Yeah, but um, do not kids often be the opposite of what their parents were? Or do they just try and... They try to do opposites, at least, right? Yeah, so my kid would be a plumber. Same with your kid. <laughs> Yeah, a friend of mine from school, he's a plumber, and he's living up on, on the beach in Noosa. <laughs> he's, he's got a great life. He just drives around inspecting government plumbing areas. Oh, right, okay. And he often has to drive along the beach in Noosa. You know, he probably had a shit time getting to where he is now. Because he was a retired. <laughs> but yeah, it makes you wonder. Well, what's... With... with um how would you see your life without art? Well, I think that art's become a business now. I'm not I'm often a businessman. So uh, I often question what art is, whether it is this innate ability to do something different from any other category. I mean, if you look at what's happening now with um, chat GPT, with artificial intelligence, you know, like if you were a writer, uh, it feels like that industry is really under, under the pump. Um, you know, you spend, a writer would spend a lot of time doing copywriting um, for ads or just for anything. That part of the world now is being taken over by AI. So, you know, it's interesting to think about where the actual part of art is within the whole business of art if you're trying to make money. And um, so, yeah, I'm not sure what I would be, but um, I think most of us, if we applied ourselves to any different industry, would hopefully excel in that. So had I been a real estate agent, I would be living maybe on the North Shore in Sydney right now. Yeah. Paying know? artists, paying artists <laughs> to make art. Paying them for ChatGPT and Mid Journey and <laughs> yeah, Discord. Just making paintings. Did you, um, do you think so on that topic of, of AI, do you think that it's clear to see that uh, there is soul missing? So when someone does something, it's, it's, it's no comparison to the, the good that they've done. All right. Um, well, that's, again, where is the art within the art? Because with things like um, artificial intelligence, with uh, visual uh, communication, you know, we spend so much time if it's painting, learning how to make the painting. So is the, is the art within the procedure of painting and the painterly skill of it? Or is it the idea? Because you know? a lot of artists, they are admired from their skill. So if the AI is taking away that skill, I think it's really blurred there whether or not... Um, whether or not it, it does have relevance. Because I think about it in a lot of my work, it's a lot of juxtapositioning. And um, 
especially in a lot of my earlier work, I'd start a painting and then project sort of a random image almost. And from that, you could make uh, a relevant and interesting final concept mm -hmm. from this randomness. Um, so I often wonder what part is actually the art. Kids, kids. <laughs> do you think um, do you think uh, if if AI is only recreating what we know, does that mean the human has to pick part of the the other side of that view? Is it is it going to take? Well, that's a very interesting question to ask me because my work is very much about appropriation and taking what's already there and reassembling that. So it's like a curatorial process in yeah. essence. Um, so for example, if I'm taking uh, Mickey Mouse, I'm gonna find uh, an image of Mickey Mouse from an old 50s comic book. And because it's all really grainy, I have to then process it into a form that can be painted. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's through a vinyl cutting machine, and if I do it that way, I've got to vector it yep. and each node of that vector has to be perfectly smooth to create the look that I'm going for. Um, so for me, a lot of the, a big part of the art is that process. And the way I vector things and the way I'll change things is down to me uh, and my style. Um, but as you mentioned, I'm not necessarily making anything new as far as conjuring anything new. It's really about amalgamating um, things that shouldn't, shouldn't be together and they're put together to make a new reading. Um, so in, in, in a way, it is like an AI algorithm because it's sourcing from um, things that are essentially within media. Um, but I suppose most art is that really. It's it's about amalgamating your what you've seen already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's very direct because it is, you know, it, it is noticeable. You can say, well, that's Mickey Mouse, and this is um, I'm Tom of Finland, mm -hmm. or you know, Frank Frazetta, or you know, amalgamating all these things, which is probably how an AI might do it. So. Yeah, I think it's a curatorial process and, you know, I reckon that if you really do look at these artworks and I think it's already happening is that I saw an AI art piece won an art award. If you didn't know that it was made by an AI, uh, who cares? But the big step is that how are you going to get that AI piece from a digital image to a physical mm. a painting? So unless they create a machine that can paint for us, then I don't see how it's really relevant because it's still gonna live in the digital world. Mm. Which is interesting, this is all happening around the time of NFTs and um, you know, more focus on that kind of thing. I'm not really into that personally, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, what is your take on it? Uh, I, I, I don't really like it. I don't. I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't like the way it's monetized. But then, of course, uh, paintings are monetized, I suppose. Um. <laughs> Where did you disappear from? Oh, no. Hey, guys. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you disappear from? Yeah, there's another. Um, another gym there and there's also a cheerleading school yeah, right. and then next door is a, a gym, gym which actually we've taken Zen to for, one, for the last six months and he's only two but you know, he rolls and stuff and yeah, pretend yeah, to be yeah. doing stuff
done that before. So she got to move to my car, I can get up around the other way, and he's still here going, just going around the other way. <laughs> How's um how's having a kid change your process? Um I suppose it's about just finding the time to do things. It's more difficult now even having a second kid. Uh though that's very fresh, so I've yet to really understand the implications of it moving forward. Um yeah, it's amazing realizing how precious your time is, especially your headspace. Um, and I know I was very reliant on the evenings to to sort of get ideas bubbling. And now I've got to really focus on a time period between nine to five, essentially. It's just like a day job. So previously ideas would come to you and you would work on them or execute them now it's like go to work with your lunchbox at five o'clock you gotta pick up the kids so you can't do any drinking or any other shenanigans mm -hmm. while you're making it so again for me uh, i make a lot of work and I often question, you know, again, where the art is in all of this because it is very much um, about fulfilling stock for an exhibition. Having an exhibition on this date, you know, I'm now planning an exhibition in two years' time. Um, the logistics of getting the artwork from here to at Los Angeles or New York, um, having staff to help me make the work. Um, and because I'm making artwork very regularly and they're big bodies of work, you know, there has to be real, um, a real concise concept of what the next show is going to be and how that can be different from the last one. Um, so, you know, I've been doing this now 20, 23 years maybe more, to, you know, pushing 20, over 20 years. Um, so, yeah, it, it becomes quite, um, quite processed and um, there has to be this bigger picture schedule. Um, and then of course there's some accountability that you have to your customers or collectors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they want you to change. They're like, but why keep doing the style? And then you change the style, and they're like, we don't like this style. We'll go back to the old style. So there's no kind of, it's, it's an interesting uh, quandary. Balance. Like balance, yeah. yeah. It's not fair balance. Do you, so it's actually a great point you said that because, and especially most having a child, has that changed your outlook on what you're creating? Um, has that given you, you know, it has actually, I must admit, just recently, because I'm getting more into reading my son, who's nearly three, kids' books. Mm -hmm. It's interesting looking at kids' books. I had been drawing a lot of imagery out of kids' books for many years, but had never really looked at the object of what this thing is, mm -hmm. and the story, the narrative. Um, so, you know, with experience and seeing new things, obviously you get new ideas. So I, I quite enjoy the, the whole concept of kids' books. Um, you know, and I look at my work, it's, it's very based in childlike uh, iconography. And to me, I've always felt like I've been existing in this child's world. Mm -hmm. And for someone who is an artist, I think you always feel like you've never grown up. Mm -hmm. So now, looking at the world through my son's eyes, who is a child, um, it's really cool to reconnect that initial concept of this childlike world. Um, 
so in a lot of ways, I suppose it has made me feel like going back to an old style um, that's talking about childlike things, um, it, but in reference to things that are happening in the world that are more pertinent. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it'll be interesting because I'm just now on paternity leave, probably go back to work in the next couple of weeks. So I've been over the last couple of months spending a lot of time journaling and jotting and because <laughs> of I've had no, no time to do anything else. Um, so yeah, the next body of work will be interesting to see how that is really... Because I think with a young kid, they're not, not... It's not until they get to be like two or three that you can even see them as a little human. So prior to that, they're just this thing that you're yeah, wiping your ass. <laughs> yeah. So now my, my son's and he's, you know, he's talking, and he's understanding concepts and you know, it's just getting more and more interesting from there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's that connection to, to, to childhood things I think is really interesting. And to what I was like as a child. Yeah. So I think we're all, every, all of our artwork is based on these, the things that affected us when we were kids or when we were younger. I don't know, do you think, do you have that? Yeah, I think so. I think I thought about this morning about how, um, it's actually funny because I'm quarantined this morning and I was talking about the show and then I, uh, my dog came in, uh, and why I love it and loved it and why I was escaping constantly and my upbringing to in being around my parents who originally just came up with this guy from Jack to the Hospital because he had cancer denying about three and a half years ago, so he had a big chunk of his lung cut out because he was a hundred cigarette smoker a day. Shit, up until when? 14 years ago. He got to the bullet, didn't get can lung cancer, but he had benign, they cut it out. And so he's every so often gets a checkup from this uh, from the surgeon. And then you think about, you know, his part of the brain, his, his, as a self-destructive loss, he was being, a, you know, a, an artist. He still is an artist, but he's, he's changed. He's got the drink culture. Yeah. Makes spirits and cheap wine. And he doesn't smoke 100 cigs a day. You know, so I was thinking about was that was that introduction into my youth why I was so well, watching him. Yeah, yeah. Well, saying yes to fucking everything. Mm. Oh, he's smoking. He's smoking. Mm. Oh, he's drinking. I was drinking. You know, like he was a role model in that way. Uh, I'm still 18, 25 years old. As much as I pissed myself at home, but you know. But yeah, I think, I think, yeah, you're very influenced by the world that you grow up in. Very much so. You know, we're a sponge. You know, even made it like, we're, we're, we're sponge on what we're doing. We're three, four years old, I think. Yeah, I often wonder whether he understands what my daddy juice is. Okay. Because I'll be drinking wine or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I don't think he does, but... Not now, anyway, not yet. No. But I haven't really thought about that. Now you've told me that, and now I'm frightened. Well, I think... What, where well, he tells me he wants to have a Spider-Man vape. Yeah, right. right. So, yeah, 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 yeah. but clearly that's not going to happen. But. <laughs> I um, I feel that with... Yeah. Yeah, I saw it was what was in the little scene, and I think that's that kind of... That affected me. And this morning, it kind of I was like, fuck, you know, I, I, I never want to think about those. Saw Dad yesterday getting sick from all the like you know, just being checked up from from all these crazy sort of misdemeanors and having fun. And you know, my dad says it was fun just to be with you. He goes, Oh, he's at the store as well. Yeah, I don't know. Like maybe I'll start taking drugs again when my son does and do it with him. Yeah, okay. Do you find that 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 does that does that influence you on your work? Uh, look, I definitely think that um, everything I do now is very calculated. So the older style of work, I kind of had to be drunk to make it. Yeah. 
because there's lots of brush strokes and uh, lots of impulsive mark making like these sort of things here which I'm sort of bringing back now to hopefully just dip my toe back into like that hey. mm -hmm. you know decision making that is impulsive um, irrational almost yeah yeah because parts of the painting they take a long time to paint um, but when you're doing it sober it's like oh should I should do that oh, I don't know I don't know but when you're just really at it um, but that's not really part of my life anymore I can't I don't have that space to keep going into no, but I, you know, I think I will find that again. It's just that at the moment, with a new kid, um, there's, a, as you said, a balance to get back to some kind of a um, schedule that is appropriate. I mean, the other thing is to, because I've got people who are working with me, for me, um, you can't sort of be as self-indulgent like you can't just take a day off or you know I have to make sure there's work for them to do oh, you can pay their bills too that's exactly it so suddenly it, yeah this becomes a, a business mm -hmm. um, or a bigger business a company essentially mm -hmm. and um, do, you, do you feel that that's how do you how have you become comfortable with that from you know, being an artist to be a company, I'm not, I, I'm not sure what you really are or what your ethos symbol is, your ideology more is, as you, you know, as you... Well, I, I'm lucky that I have the ability to make larger paintings and also the smaller things that only I can make. Mm -hmm. So, part of my studio up there, um, I can essentially make all the stuff up there for the larger stuff to be made here on the floor. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting how to make things on scale because, you know, we're talking about prints and things like this, like, that's also a big part of my, my art and business. So I can make an artwork and then print X amount um, but this idea of going overseas or going and doing ex exhibitions with a large body of work, you know, it, it's it's amazing. Sometimes I see shows that you know they're filling you know, four hundred square meters of space, and they're all hand painted. You know, and it's like surely that would have taken like several years to get that many paintings together. So they're either doing that or, um, or they can make it very quickly. But for me, like hand painting things takes quite a long time. So I moved into an automated process mm -hmm. um, such that whether I made it or someone else made it, it, it would look identical. Um, but, essentially, but I'm making all of the vectors. So in a way, I've already made the artwork before it hits a board like these things or it hits the line yeah yeah like whether i made those or someone else made them it would still look the same so in a, in a way it is a, a printmaking process um but it's using technology and it's innovating like this sort of there's no human mark making and i think that was a big thing for me at university was to get away from the traditional idea of human mark making so that it was like an Andy Warhol kind of an angle um, and you know using projectors to get to the be able to perfectly do an outline or the old school um, stencils with spray paint so yeah I'm interested in this idea of mass production and talking about concepts that um, talking about pop art concepts that are also involved in consumerism and mass production so the artwork reflects the kind of uh, ideology that it's talking about mm, okay. Liberius or Raspberries? 
uh, you know, a more of a strawberry kind of guy. Whiz fizz or curly whirly? Oh, uh, well, I'd say whiz fizz. Yeah, I had a big problem with whiz fizz there for many years. <laughs> <laughs> big boss or fags? The fags they used to call Fags. Them. Yeah. Oh, shit. So the big bosses were, from memory, like a, more of a cigar. But a big red, like a dog's dick? No, a brown with a red tip. What were the dog dick ones? Maybe a big boss, wasn't it? I know there was musk sticks. Oh, musk sticks. That was pink. That was pink. Were fags, fads, fags, they were white? Fags, fags, fags were white with the red tip and then they changed them to fags and they got oh, they got rid of the two boys in the packet. Yeah, there was one boy. One boy and they got rid of the red tip. So they turned them into basically, basically musk sticks, in a sense. How's that for a um, subliminal message <laughs> on the confection board? Well, they would change it from fags because of the homosexual angle. But then they couldn't sell it as a cigarette. That was no, exactly. my own cigarettes. I, don't, I can't th say I've ever had a big boss, big boss or a dog stick in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no joke. Rhea, it's amazing now having a kid and trying to introduce him to lollies, but the candy. But uh, it's not a thing, like, you're not supposed to give kids sugar anymore. No, 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 you don't let you give anything to kids anymore, not, not even the good times. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's so many awesome, well, a lot of my paintings are about oh, painting on candy packages. Mm. Um, and most of the American ones, so there's so many American candies and, well, oh, yeah. European candies as well that it's almost a nostalgia for something you've never experienced. Mm, mm, mm. Kind of weird. Um, yeah, because I've been taking Zen in coals or whatever, they've got those big tubs for the cell. Um, so, yeah, there's no way I would now go and do that if I didn't have a kid. Because yeah, no. now we're like, oh, let's try the sour stuff. Yeah. yeah. Fucking warhead. Let's put that. Yeah. So, where to, um, where to with, with the next, the next part, like the next part of um, your career, I guess? Um, Where's the focus going to take you? Yeah, well, everything's now looking through the lens of uh, post COVID. Um, and you know, are we now pre World War Three or something? Mm -hmm. um, we go through a recession and then we go through a boom again. And yeah, that's quite a fearful thing. Um, but as with everything, it seems like the media hypes us up, hypes us up to be really fearful of something or other, and then it doesn't quite end up being what they said it would be. Mm. Um, so yeah, looking through the lens of Post-COVID, uh, I mean, we were talking before about, you know, doing things last year as like this ejaculatory expelling of all of the work that we've been building up through COVID. Um, and it was really interesting going over to Miami in December to do the Scope Art Fair. I had done Scope twice before. Um, and then I stopped for three years, two of those years because of COVID. And going back to what I thought it would be like, and it was just completely different. Okay. How so? Uh, well, a, lo a lot of artists had moved on, like they'd gotten older perhaps. Um, it wasn't the wild party that it used to be, and, the, and of course, I didn't see as many familiar faces, mm -hmm. um, and I suppose the style of art keeps bobbling forward and evolving. Um, so yeah, I think with COVID, um, your life was put on pause, I suppose, and then it's like now when you're ready to go back to being the person you were, 
when you press unpause, everything's changed. I suppose not completely, but to some degree, um, wondering whether these things are as interesting or as beneficial as previously thought. But yeah, it's strange because this big two-year gap is going to be taken out of our lives. Mm -hmm. And we were talking earlier about local galleries and, you know, doing the gallery hops that we used to do, you know, every Friday or Thursday night. And, uh, you know, just having lost that thread, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting or difficult to re-establish re that community or re-establish what to do. It's almost like a scratching of the head. It's like, what the fuck do I do next? So during COVID, did you, during that two year period, did you uh, do much work? It was interesting because I had two guys working with me previous to COVID and COVID happened. So I was kind of obliged to keep them paid mm -hmm. so they had nothing to do i had nothing to do other than make art so we all came together and made a hell of a lot of art yeah, cool. um it was actually really profitable that year as i think a lot of artists would say mm -hmm. um whether that was because people were sitting at home nothing to do but <laughs> get drugs delivered um but buying stuff online, you know, they could just sit and buy yeah. stuff online. Yeah. Um, and if you were set up already, then so. yeah. Makes seem I think NFTs were such a such a fucking move during that period. Yeah, it's it's interesting how all of this crisscrosses and how it must have influenced each other. And you know, now we're into AI. Um, yeah, so fads, aren't they? Some kind of oh, I think at the moment it all seems like yeah, fads. Yeah, though I think token like I see it. Yeah, Pogs. Yeah, <laughs> Pogs. <laughs> Marvel did it like ages ago. Right? No. Um. So what was it about? Fads, NFT, social mm. profitability during COVID, online sales. I think um, how COVID, yeah, you, you and the other two that were there for you, like created so much art, made it so much profit in the world. Did, um, yeah, uh, so I, I've just been on paternity leave now. Uh, helping out my girlfriend uh, with the new baby, which has been interesting. It's interesting having a second child and how different that is to having the first one and how moving on with two of them is another thing in itself. Um, so I suppose that's very influential clearly on what my process is going to be like moving forward. but. Yeah, I'd like to do something here in Australia or in Melbourne uh, sometime this year to try and just try and get back to some sense of community because um, it's all well and good going overseas and um, selling things there and trying to build up more of an audience over there. But when you come back, um, you kind of kind of not connecting yeah. yeah not I mean it's not really about connecting with the audience really is it it's just about connecting with other artists yeah, yeah. and um, when we had versus gallery in Richmond three or four years ago uh, you know that fulfilled that element which is great um, but yeah I'm, I'm interested to see how fractured everything really is because a lot of artists are only really getting back on their feet now and um, and yeah, as we were talking about, um, Chapel Street and Northcote as well, uh, you know, it only feels like, like in the last couple of months, 
things are really starting to blossom. Yeah, yeah. Like the shoots that were started maybe six months ago are now starting to really come up. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably the same thing with artists and um, the hangover from COVID is going to have to last a couple of years. Mm -hmm. It's not going to just suddenly bang everyone's back onto it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so yeah, it's just been a bit tentative. I've uh, just done these big shows last year. Um, got a show planned in Los Angeles in 2024 and then trying to switch into a New York show sometime in there or maybe 2025. So that's weird planning shows like two years in advance. Um, Organised. Hmm. Organised planning. Yeah. So just to rewind it back, um, what, how did this all begin? Where did it all start? The, the, the art, the, what's the roots? What are, what are you? Uh, so I grew up in Queensland, about an hour north of Brisbane, Sunshine Coast. Mm -hmm in the idyllic mountainside of Mullaney. Um, it's kind of a rural touristy village, lots of cows, which overlooks the Glasshouse Mountains. It's very beautiful. Um, tried, was really good at art at school, tried to get into university, art, art college, got knocked back. So I went and did a year of TAFE in art, went and did uh, three years of fine art um, and came out of um, college at a time when uh, whatever art I was doing at the time made a bit of a splash, faked my own death, did these like performance art things, started getting in the newspaper a lot. Did you it was unknown causes. <laughs> but no, we made, I did an exhibition before I moved to Melbourne yeah. in 2000. And it was called Ben Frost is Dead. And as the invitation, we made, um, it looked as if it was a clipping from a newspaper funeral notices. Obituary. Yeah. Well, saying that you could come to the gallery for the, for the um, like it, like it. for the ceremony. Yeah. Anyway, I was I think hooked up with um, Institute of Modern Art in Brisbane at the time, and they sent out these little snippets in with their mailers, which went around all, all the in physical invitations went all around Australia, and of course, all these art people from around Australia thought, "Oh, this artist has died." I got in the newspaper all this sort of stuff. So that kind of gave me a leg up and pushed me forward and a series of other things like that. Um, but yeah, coming from a really regional place, I was always very focused on trying to get overseas, trying to push myself to get out of this rural, um, maybe not rural is not the right word, but regional, regional sort of place, which is Queensland was probably still is a little bit um so yeah i've been just been doing a lot of traveling and for whatever reason you know maybe because when i was well i my parents took me overseas a few times when i was younger so that probably instilled this idea of america being this great place and america being this place to to make it which i suppose is inherent with most people um, yeah, but I've always approached, you know, street art, illustration, graphic design with a fine art sensibility. So I feel that having been trained initially or pushed in that direction of um, ac academia um, and applying that to things like illustration, graphic design, street art through my career has given my stuff, which being pop art, uh, can look as if it's very one dimensional, but um, there's a lot more meaning and um, 
rhetoric going on within the works rather than just a, a surface level thing. Sure, of course. So I think that's sort of given me an edge. Um, and also this idea of mass production and, um, you know, I've just really been in a pop art. I love the trappings of um, popular culture and this love-hate kind of feeling towards consumerism and cereal packaging. Supermarkets, you know, I'm, I would have to say going to the supermarket is without a doubt the highlight of my week. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> which aisle? <laughs> you know, that, that's some people that hate that, but you know, it's, uh, it's definitely a social outing for us. I mean, how do you feel about shopping? Uh, some people get still get things delivered just to have it. In and out. Yeah, so you guys love. Always, I know what I want. I go in, get what I want, get the fuck out. So smooth. You know, I have Lee's girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> you shop in dark alleys. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I love the whole cereal packaging aisle and. I did do this I was I did some blogging for Juxtapos magazine years ago and I had done this blog post that sort of discussed how if you look at most breakfast cereals how ejaculatory it is like it's all this sort of like milk milk yeah and I, and I did like a sort of a illustrative thing where I put like Bukaki you know like a Bukaki photo which this sort of jizz on the face kind of thing but that's kind of what they're doing with this ejaculatory thing in the, on the kids cereal packaging so I don't know whether that's who they're marketing that to. But yeah, if you look at them, it's all these bowls of milk. And it's just jizzing and cereal. Have you ever seen that movie, uh, 99 Franks? Franks one? No. About the advertising uh, world? No. And there, there's this uh, classic scene where it's, um, it goes into, it takes Scooby Man in. It turns into a cartoon, but it's just like a little sort of uh, 15 minutes while they're going through it. Right, and it's all showing how ridiculous the advertising is. There was a yogurt commercial. It's this hot chick with yogurt um, going on and it's just in the face and it's like, what? what's happening here? Well, it's different now than it was oh, you know. 50 years or 30, what, many, many years ago. I was just watching some 80s commercials. Uh, oh, it's a bit messy with you. <laughs> true. You know, it's Horse Fest and you Philip Morris. Yeah, right. Oh, and also, um, the whole concept of television is not a thing. Like, I was reading a kid's book to my son, and it's like, the character was famous, and he got to be on television. And it was all these TVs with his face on it. But the concept of being on TV news, that's not a thing anymore. You, you want to, you, everyone wants to be internet famous. Yeah. But who watches television anymore? Or YouTube, TikTok. Yeah. I don't read no. Oh, YouTube. I watch a lot of YouTube. What do you What do you do to on YouTube? Uh, well, I spend way too much on time on Reddit. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think that I must have an addiction. I think they've captured my brain. What do you? What What, what addicts you? Like what takes you? What takes you away from Reddit? What's? What well, it must be their you? algorithm because I can't get off it. Okay. I mean, I can't watch. Inst I can't look at Instagram. That makes me feel terrible because you're just scrolling through other people's. It's just this competitive puts me on edge. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. And you're looking at other people's stuff, and it's like everyone's trying to get your attention and say how good they are. And then you see something, and you think, oh my god, that's so good. My work's not anywhere as good as that. And you just feel terrible. And then. <laughs> and it's just this. Look at this car. Yeah, well, 
I don't look at hot chicks as cars. But, um. <laughs> well, they don't, but. Well, it's not as much. Bit like, your stream would be very specific to obviously you. Yes. But if you wanted to have. Well, I find like Reddit doesn't have that. I'm not just consuming other artists' stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just Reddit is a massive slice of the internet. It's like everything that's on the internet is condensed into this thing mm -hmm. in different subreddits. Um, I mean, I don't use Twitter. I don't use Facebook anymore. I think as soon as our parents started using Facebook, it was all over. <laughs> The we day make my dad. We make oh yeah, MySpace. Yeah. Actually, MySpace was amazing. That was a good old days. Good old days, man. MySpace was good. Were you top friends? You did. Yeah, I mean, you could have MP3s playing. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Little animations. You had to learn coding. Yeah. <laughs> but you had to actually know HTML. Yeah. Put things in. Those were days. Mario or Super Mario? Uh, well, Super Mario, the Nintendo, the Sega thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm getting. I've just started doing a series about computer games, mixed with drugs. Oh yeah, man. Well, I just did last year Pac Man, which is an MDMA. Yeah. It was running. Eating pills, which is clearly what Pac Man was doing. Yeah, sounds like an old generation kid that played Pac Man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, Did you play? Were you big into video games when you were a kid? Yeah, I, I was always down at the arcade with the 20 cent machines. Um, so? Playing a lot of games. Um, there was an amazing one I was always enamored with, was the. I think it's the Return of the Jedi, and you could get inside it. Okay. It's a Star Wars thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or maybe it was maybe the Empire Strikes Back, but you're inside a Tie Fighter. Yeah, and it had these like really cool like yeah. single like vector uh, laser lines that you could shoot at these things. So that was amazing. Um, my I most remember playing things on the Commodore 64. Okay. Um. But yeah, I think everyone was Space Invaders and Frogger. Frogger was cool. Bobble Bobble. Spyros. 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 I had that. I remember. Oh my god. I'm surprised you haven't got. Did you go to Spyros and Spyros Island? Yes. Did you? I did one on the. Um, what was it? Yeah. Under the game. What was that? Um, Commando. There was. I did a um, Spy vs. Spy on a. Actual 2020 ballot paper, the US, oh, yeah. US ballot paper. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, That's cool. Yeah. I like that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've, at the moment, I've got a PS4. I've got millions of games. I don't have any time to play them. But and when you do, you feel like you're wasting your time. Yes. <laughs> and if I've seen sitting there playing it, and Nixie sees me doing it, she'd be like, why are you doing this? But I'm, so I'm waiting for my son to be old enough to play them with me. And then you use that as an excuse. Yes. <laughs> but how cool will that be generationally? Because with his Spider-Man vape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but how cool will that be generationally? Because I know I played computer games with my dad, but he wasn't really interested in it, really. But... I'd be so there playing with my son. So let's do it the opposite way around. Tell me um, who you are, what your name is, and what you do. My name is Ben Frost. I'm an artist, I'm a curator, I'm a businessman, um, I'm a dad, and a 
double dive. He is he is ejaculated from left and right now. <laughs> yeah, it's surprising as I said with all. There's something wrong with us. Sort of buying for the big bad us. All plumbers. Yeah, yeah, real estate agents. Yeah, it's hard. Artists and bread makers. Bread makers. Well, it's really about, oh, actually, if he could be a sushi sh sushi chef, I know. that would be amazing. Endless sashimi and yeah. sushi. Yeah. I think you want your kids to do something that you have a missing in your life. And he can jack around the fucking world. Those motherfuckers know how to make stuff really, really well. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to define who you are, what you are. Um, yeah, I remember having Christmas dinner with someone's family friend and it was this chick and she said that she was very happy to tell us that she was proficient in 50 different things. <laughs> and it's like, well, if you were really to break it down what you're proficient in, it is a million things, but you've got to decide on one, or not one, but you know, a small grouping of mm. them. Well, I'm definitely a career. Yeah. I can say that. Definitely a photographer, or a singer, or a video maker, or a video person. I've always wanted to be a cinematographer. I just gone through the notions of getting from where I am now to that, to maybe becoming more of an image maker just about. And I think. Uh, Party liaison would be pretty fun. Party liaison? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Do you think it's about that? It was in the beginning. Well, well, it was my 20s. I think it was about 20 or 21. Yeah. Get out and meet, it, whoever, meet whoever you can, wherever you can, and, and, and you know, be the chameleon that we are. And who you latch onto sort of then defines who you become. Uh, who, who, not even latch onto, but like who speaks in my position, who because you stay yeah. strong don't you? You, like, I, I feel like I've, I've never kind of wavered in who I was you never fucking like me fuck off you know it was never but there's this longing to be a cinematographer or there's this longing for me to be something yeah the longing is, is to be making films that have some kind of meaning I think mm. you know in the beginning it's like let's go make fucking gangster films you know let's go do this I see man and then as, as I get older I'm like oh, Sort of that glorifying something that's not, you know, that's, that looks cool and something that's something that's out of my reach. So that kind of little story that I want to know about is I, I, I'm looking for something to see where I am without. I suppose that's again what we're saying about trying to find the art in the crap mm. because it, you got to sort of spend a lot of time up beneath the crap before you can find out where the what sticks with you. Yeah, the beauty of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But what's 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 keeping you doing it? You know. Sometimes I think that's what it's about. It's like well, getting out of your own way. In a sense. Yeah, because years will go past and you'll be like, oh, well, I've just been, well, I'm just making money, or am I? Who am I trying to prove this to? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. And you're like, well, I'm not. But then like, those people aren't in my life anymore. But yeah. I think this year has been a lot. Something happened within the last year, particularly in my last couple of years. I just kind of like, yeah, fuck it. Just take this angst, the ideas of producing a movie, angst to just producing things to do something else with my life as well, because because I feel a bit like shit. You know, when something kind of just kind of like gets me up again, and something that I feel like I can't work for, and then it's like, okay, if I'm not working, then If you're not working, you're not making money. Well, if I'm not, yeah, if I'm not taking photos, there's no passive. Yeah. If you will. So I'm kind of trying to create that passive so I can go. But can you, I'm just trying to think of what it's like to be a photographer. Can you? I could hire. I could create. But you can turn a short amount of time into a lot of money? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
place, which is beneficial as far as the people who are trying. And at the moment, I'm not holding enough clients, you know, and, and saying that, you know, we're going to wait till we pay the final bill. If we pay the sum, we'll recover, and then we'll, you know, start again. Start again. Yeah, start again. So yeah. like, whereas now it's more of, hey, I'm going to have these people to work on the first schedule. I've become a bit of a night client. I don't do the late nights anymore. Maybe my rules dwindle a little bit. Maybe it's, it's when they do come, it's right down. But I think it's more of being a business man now. Mm. And yes, the, the production side of things is where I'm sort of like, well, don't do that. Yeah, well, as we get older, you know, things like buying houses and shit like that suddenly start becoming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or dealing with banks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, having an accountant and. <laughs> I just did my tax this morning, actually. Um, it's just such a pain in the ass. Oh, it's, it's not really a pain in the ass anymore because I've got a bookkeeper. But um, yeah, people do do it. Like, oh, it's a good day. Like, yeah, to understand that. And I think as young artists, we didn't do that. I think the best thing to do as a young artist is paint as little as fucking possible. Because then they'll just, you know, it's a bass payment and anything. I, well, it's under 70, it's claiming everything. Okay, a little bit more than 25. Yeah, but, sure. you know. It's under a grand. Yeah, 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 exactly right. Yeah. And then your creative account will tell you, oh, every time I just pay myself a little bit more. Yeah, well, as an adult now, <laughs> I know a few people have been audited, but really, it's you're just sort of self reporting. And if they decide this doesn't look right, we're going to look into it, but <coughs> it's it's just a weird baffling system. But they don't teach you at school. No, it's just you've got to work it out yourself. Work out yourself. Yeah. 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 But do you think that school, uh, and, and I hear this, and I heard this in my late 20s and early 30s about people that I went to school with, oh, you know, school didn't teach us this, it didn't teach us that, but what did school teach us? And do you think it taught us? Process of thinking. Yeah, well, it's universities are, I think. Yeah. Like, I didn't really learn to paint there. And what could you learn there for three years, mm -hmm. four years? What can you really learn? It's just like a, a structure of how to think or how to go about thinking. And then, as soon as you come out of university, you're like bored of gates. It's like, right, let's, let's make this happen as a young person with that energy. Mm -hmm. So I think university is really important. Um, but there's this big backlash now against academia. Like the right is attacking the left of the, the world being so woke. But essentially that's a reflection of academia. And, um, and if you don't think more deeply about things, then the world, I suppose, is a simpler place. But who wants to live in a simple world? <laughs> I suppose we all do, really, but... Um, Nothing's ever said black and white, is it? Yeah, that's right. But that's where we live, as, as, you know, as a filmmaker or an artist. You, we live um, in the thing, in the different shades of colour. Mm. Yeah, so I suppose with school... Um, I don't know, maybe... Maybe... Maybe this time around, parents or this time in the timeline, modern parents are more helpful to push them into different directions. You know, maybe my parents didn't tell me how to do accounting, or you know, our parents or who's supposed to tell you these things? Maybe it is supposed to be parents, not teachers. Mm. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, maybe is that why. Yeah. So nepotistic, everything that works around us, and nepotism runs wild. Do you have brothers or sisters? No, me neither. So, yeah. Right, so maybe that actually is a, a, a stumbling block because you didn't have an older brother or sister to. No reference points. Yeah. So wild siblings. Really? Wild. I mean, my parents have got a letter framed from my uh, teacher that. Described how I threw three kicks in the direction of the teacher. Um, this thing was described by the, 
Um, what did Mr. Lee think of it? Uh, was it a good entry pretext? It's out of the head that it was fucking phenomenal. At what age? 15. That's an old age. Yeah, that was an old age. Yeah. And especially as a teacher. Oh, yeah. Where was this? No, but not Mulgrave. Because he's quite respected for his work. In where? Mulgrave. Mulgrave. Right. Yeah. right, so you were Melbourne. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was born in Durban, but I was grew up here. I've become a year older. Right. Yeah. So do you get around much to anywhere else in Australia? Yeah, I've seen quite a bit of Australia. The only thing I haven't seen is probably from Darwin, just down to here in New South. Yeah. That last thing is not too much Australia. Because there's East Coast, much of the South Coast, and a little bit of that West Coast there. Albany, not too much until that, that, that beach there. That's great. It's, I mean, it's interesting, a lot of people, especially in Sydney, I have to tell you. Well, Melbourne's quite, uh, a lot of these places are very, like, into it and they just won't go to another place. Like how much we're talking about this hatred for Sydney. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I know Sydney has the same feeling about Melbourne. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's two different uh, mindsets over there. You know, Sydney, you'll meet someone, the first thing they'll ask you is what you do and how much money you make. Yeah. Melbourne's like, oh, where's the closest pub and anyone be weed or crack? <laughs> You know, like, it's two different mindsets. I think, um, yeah, it's more conservative up there. It's more so because of that. Yeah, I think Sydney's so, probably right. Um, but I did find Sydney was, it was kind of the, the airport of the world in that everyone in Sydney was just trying to get overseas. But everyone in Melbourne was trying to just be more Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Because Melbourne had this, really cool place you could live. Mm. It's very livable here. Mm. Why would you want to live in Melbourne? Well, it's it become a bit of America, right? You know, what's the city where the most fucking Statue of Liberty and... Uh, Dan Andrews, Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I felt like a lot of people were coming back and forward. I don't know. Yeah, I, I just found a lot of people in Melbourne weren't necessarily very focused on going overseas or trying to make it overseas. Yeah. Um, but that's just a biased perspective because I was living in Sydney. Yeah. Wait, how about that pizza pie? How does that wait till the phone's allowed us to I'm happy to wrap it if you have to. Yeah, well, I think uh, <laughs> we could talk, we could talk, yeah. I think we could talk about yeah. how much we cropped down to. Or how much are you looking for?